Good morning. This is the Innovation Conversation. How you doing, Tom? Good morning, Kevin. Happy New Year. Can you still say Happy New Year on the 10th or 11th? I think we're on the cusp. I think after after this, you can't. But All right. Well, a final we're... Happy New Year to Thank everyone you. out there. Good morning, yeah. Newsbeat Land. So uh, a lot of stuff's happened since last we talked. Uh, I want to get to it in a second. Uh, Amazon announced they're laying off 18,000 people, not 10. Well, we'll come to that in a second. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about there was a really interesting piece in the Washington Post business section um, with a headline that says, big tech is in crisis. That's exactly what it needed. And sort of the premise of the piece is that um, there has been an illusion, especially over the past decade, that big tech has been in, in investing and rolling out big innovations. But in fact, it hasn't. Um, in fact, let me quote. For the past five to 10 years, the tech industry has offered precious few groundbreaking services as it grew fat on old business models. Our most important computing device is still a rectangular metal slab made by Apple or Samsung. Google is so terrified is disrupting, uh, of disrupting its most important revenue source advertising that it has barely changed search. And Amazon's AWS is still printing money as the biggest world's biggest cloud provider. Um, they have also acted like giant squids, sucking up all the talent in the sector to the detriment, to the detriment of startups. Um, and, because, and it's incredibly expensive just to hire people. I'm sure you've found that. Venture capital funding for low margin tech startups is declining after years of overindulging business ideas that never should have been funded. Um, and VC investors say they're now gravitating back to firms that build software and offer higher margins. So, I mean, first of all, I'm curious, would you agree with the notion that there has not been nearly as much innovation as we're sort of, we're led to believe by the media or whoever over the past 10 years? You know, I, I, I didn't, until you had forwarded me the article and I read that, I hadn't really considered, you know, how innovation has looked, you know, looking back recently. And, and I would agree with that. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I think the last big waves of innovation were things around like, you know, IoT, early machine learning, um, some new business models, uh, you know, whether it's like sales automation or whether it's e-commerce or there was like relatively interesting innovation in there. And then I think the bigger companies, you know, uh, were doing some innovation around advertising, maybe some innovation around devices and voice and things like that. Uh, but a lot of that like was kind of 10 ish years ago when the, when the actual innovations were occurring. So I do agree that probably the last 10 years were a little less about innovating and a little more about scaling and winning the markets and the battles and building on top of that last wave of, of innovation. And yeah, I think that that's what you saw is you saw, you know, companies that, um, we're growing in the software space. We're generating decent revenues and cash flows if you're a big established company. Um, we're coming in to compete around the edges uh, in, in these spaces where venture money was, was flowing in. Um, and I think you, you ended up with um, a fair amount of cheap capital uh, that was put to work in there. And, and yeah, a lot of overhiring and definitely uh, I don't say overpaying because that's where market was, but certainly pumping up a market. You know, if you have to pay a software developer three hundred thousand dollars, now software developers are valuable, right. but you know that adds up. You know, when you start to uh, start put those numbers across uh, numbers of developers, and the big companies could pay that. So, you know, I would say it's not surprising that the industry has hit a pause here, especially when you consider higher interest rates. A lot of these companies need debt, uh, you know, to help to help finance their growth. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say it was, it was what it needed sitting in a tech seat. Uh, I don't think it needed it. I mean, I think it is, I do think it's healthy. Uh, but you know, it, it does make, you know, building and growing a tech company now a little bit harder. Yeah. To what extent is it the fault, fault, maybe not being the right word, but for, I can't come up with a better one right now, but can, is this the fault of the, the people on the VC side, the investment folks? who would rather invest their money in scaling things up as opposed to long, starting something new. Is that, is that part of the root of the problem? And that, and cause you, that's that you got to go where the money is, right? Oh yeah. No, I think, you know, the, 
the big VC theme of the last decade of, of, the, of the last decade was you know go big fast, right? So spend to spend to scale, spend to win the share, and then once you've won the share and and snuffed out all the potential competition, you can then you know realize a yield off of the money that went in. And so you were seeing you know you you know billion dollar valuation companies that were kind of barely getting going but had this promise. And that money was going in. And I think, you know, it, back in the early, early venture capital days, it was about putting money behind innovations, right? Taking a risk before the market proved that, you know, there, that there was a market for that thing you were building, right? You actually had to do a little research. And you had to believe in a vision. Yeah. And you had to believe in the, in, in, in the team that was building that technology. And you had to believe that they could actually bring that thing to market. And that was going to be really valuable. And the money went there. And that tended to not be as big money, right. um, but that was important money. And, and I think that, yeah, I think venture in general has shifted dramatically toward the scaling side. You know, show me a product that works. Show me, you know, it's scaling in the market today so I can see product market fits there. I can mitigate all that risk. And then I just get to put this big lump of, of, of capital on top of it because, you know, as a VC f firm, you know, I have lots of, I have lots of access to capital. Um, and, you know, generally there's been good return on doing these things. So I'm able to do that. And I think that that's challenged now that we've seen public valuations come down, right? We've seen, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, rationality kind of come into the market and, and, uh, it's a little bit of a different formula now. Is part of also the problem that companies, I mean, that, that VCs got burned by the likes of, you know, like the, you know, we're all familiar with the Uber story, the WeWork story, the Therano story, right? That there were a lot of high profile uh, entrepreneurs out there who also um, had a bit of the con man in them, right? And, right and, and so VCs maybe got a little burned by the idea that, you know, I got to be careful what, you know, I got to be a little bit more careful where, where I'm putting my money. Otherwise, I end up funding, you know, uh, the guy from WeWork. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's some learning there. But I also think that up until six months ago, people looked past that learning and were willing to jump into it like an FTX, right? And put a bunch of money in there with not nearly enough diligence, right? And, you know, allow those oh, disciplines to yeah. slip a little bit. Right. So the learning should be there. And I think now, like now that the economy is where it is, you know, another collapse happens here. I think that everybody's kind of spidey sense is up. Right. Uh, on, you know, not wanting to be sold, uh, which is tough. I will say even as a, as a tech, you know, entrepreneur, like you're always trying to, to balance that, you know, uh, your vision and your enthusiasm, what you need to have, because building companies is really hard. And you have to have that, that enthusiasm, that vision. You have to convince people in your company, you know, in your, and continuing to convince them in your vision and, and they buy into it. And then you're all convincing each other, which is great. You got to convince the market. You got to convince investors, and um, you always want to have that balance of like that right amount of, uh, amount of charisma, but also back it up with like valid, legit business plan, valid, legit technology, IP, you know, and kind of, of really showing it. And um, you know, I think the industry had had gotten a little bit away from that uh, the last few years and followed the charisma, followed the momentum, and uh, you know, and it worked for a while because you can invest in an early stage company. And knowing it's going to grow up to a certain point where somebody like a SoftBank or a Tiger Global or somebody is going to go do the unicorn, you know, deal. So you as the investor that came in when the company was worth 20 or 50 million, you get a 20 to 50 return when the thing's worth a billion, right? You knew that there was going to be that investor there for that. Well, that investor there, SoftBank, Tiger Global, those type of investors, they're not there now. Yeah. The public markets aren't very good either. So it does put pressure on that earlier stage and mid-stage VC. So... And before we move on to Amazon, last question on this one. Huh? Does, when you read, what should retailers and, and suppliers for that matter, companies that are not technology companies, but that yeah. are, have a, have a technology footprint because they have to in, in 2023, when, when they see a story like this, what should they be thinking in terms of how they approach innovation and investing for that matter? You know, that's a really, that's a really, really good question course because you asked it but it is a really good question um and you know I, and i would say that it's it's easy 
to get caught up in, all right, what should I be investing in now? What should I be bringing to the market because of what I'm hearing is hot and what I'm hearing is important? I think that's an input, should be an input to the way you think, but it comes back to the classic. What do I, what do I wanna be for my customers, right? How am I going to solve their problems better next year or better now than I did prior? And what are the things I can do to make their lives easier and the innovations I can bring them? And if you start with that and work backward, then it does really rationalize, you know, what it is you might go build. Now, there may be a hot space. So you maybe have some things proven or you may hear, you know, whatever technology is hot and customers are taking it up and you can make that evaluation. All right. Does that, does that uh, help me do what I want to do for my customers? But it has to come, it has to be about your customers first. Oh, uh, I, I agree a thousand percent. I mean, to me, if I were a retailer or a supplier for that matter, I, I would, the bottom line question I would, I would, I would ask and want to be answered for me before I invested anything is how is this going to bring me closer to my customers? Absolutely. Right. If it, if in any way, shape or form, it's going to distance me from my customers. Yeah. I don't, it's all Absolutely. about being more in touch with what what is relevant to them, what resonates for them, all that kind of stuff. And if, if you can't answer that question, then, you know, you're, you're, go talk to No, you need to answer that question first. And then Trebek would always say, you know, the, 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 the retailer question would always be, and who else is doing it, right? Because yeah. retailers always want to know like what their competition is doing. And I do think that's important. Um, you know, who, who has validated this? How have they validated it? Um, am I willing to be the first one to validate something? In some cases, maybe you will want yeah. to be, but in other cases, maybe I want to see it rolled out somewhere first, you know, to not get the kinks out of it and get a little comfort. Then I'm going to be willing to take it in and lean into it and, and really, really yeah. wow my customers. Well, and that's, I, oh, this is it's another conversation, but the, the structure used to be there in the industry, I think a lot more effectively for, for, for small retailers to test this stuff out and become laboratories and be willing to be first It'll give them a first mover advantage. And, um, and that doesn't seem to happen the same way anymore. And that's a, that's a shame, but there, they used to be, it was almost like an underground of retailers who were, you know, anywhere from, you know, three to 30 stores. And that's where, that's where the innovators. Yeah. That's where the interesting stuff was happening. Well, they also are closest to the customers. Um, so the the second piece I want to talk to is this was a column and I referred to this on morning news It was a column written by Martin Pierce uh, for the innovation for the information and um and it was a, a real a, a, an examination of Amazon's uh, economics and um you know one of the things he talks about is you know the fact that um again I'll read a little bit of it to you by last September 30th, Amazon's balance sheet so showed that it had more debt than cash for the first time since 2004. That made $52 billion evaporated in just seven quarters. The major reason is that cash produced from operations shrank to just under $40 billion in the 12 months of September, while spending on capital expenditures and acquisitions soared. Now it's obviously taken, making, made steps to, to cut back, but maybe there are things it shouldn't have invested in. Then he says... The company is not in good shape if you set aside Amazon Web Services. Excluding the results from the cloud business, it lost $8.1 billion in the first nine months of 2022. And that's despite the fact that it generated $26 billion in high-end ad revenue in the same period. Imagine how much money it would be losing if it weren't for that. Where is the money going? Um, basic question is, uh, is this an endemic problem? Is it a systemic sort of institutional problem or is it just cyclical? Because a lot of the things he's describing in there are, is the stuff that made Amazon special. It made them grow. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, their, their balance sheet is very uh, strained right now relative to where, you know, they've always had a fortress balance sheet, you know, low cost of capital, lots of cash. Uh, there's cost of capital still low, but um, and it is it is strained now. Um, uh, you know, it, I think the the cyclical impact of this downturn now, uh, how it affects their customer, how it affects their 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 consumer customer, how it affects their enterprise business customers, how it affects their advertising customers, right? It is it's cyclical on all fronts. You know, is is you know endemically could you say Amazon's not well run? 
you may be able to argue that, but um, you know, this is, and I, I was in Amazon for a couple of these, you know, these, these, these cycles do happen right now in the past, they've happened on a much smaller company, a much less complicated out of, out of public view and out <laughs> yeah, of public right. view, right. Much less complicated. They didn't have stores. They didn't have their own trucks driving around the roads. They didn't have, you know, the, the physical presence in our daily lives. They didn't have devices that, you know, they're de or they're, they're changing their investment in now, right? So now we see it all, you know, a lot more, uh, it's a lot more right in front of our face. Um, you know, that, you know, so, so that said, it's a tough, it is a tough time. I think it's cyclical. Um, you know, you said, you know, well, what if they didn't have the advertising? What if they didn't have AWS? Yeah, but they do have it. Right. Right. And because they do have it, it enables them to invest in other parts of their business to continue to win share. And, you know, while Amazon's not gaining share at the pace as it used to, it's still gaining share. Right. Right. It's still quarter to quarter is gaining share in e-commerce, despite, you know, all the, yeah. the, the other retailers that are growing, you know, e-commerce share around it. Um you know, that it, that said, it's a tough time for them. They've got to get through this. They've got to weather this. Um, and, uh, you know, will your prediction of a return of Bezos come true? Uh, you know, I can see how folks, some folks would, uh, would welcome that. Um, you know, but I don't, I, I don't know that, that Andy and team are, are mismanaging this. I, I really don't. Um, I don't know that you'd go back and not buy MGM, right? Would you go back and not, you know, if you could do it again, you know, Andy's even said, I would still invest in the network given what we knew then. Yeah. Um, you know, they overcooked it a little bit because their data model overcooked it a little bit. But, uh, you know, so I don't know. I think it's still being run well. You know, I hear analysts or, or investors like Bill Miller, who's a well known longtime investor in Amazon, he's increasing his stake in the company now. He very much believes in Jassy and the team and, and where they're at now. So, you know, I, I, you know, I get, there's a lot of reason to question it. There's no doubt about it. So there's a lot in that article that like, yeah, you know, that is pretty scary. And the, the stock prices has, has shown that, you know, being down more than 50%. Yeah. Start to come back a little bit now, but yeah. it's got a long way to go. And to be clear, when I've said that, I think uh, Bezos is, com it, it will come back. Um, that's not because I think the company's being mismanaged. Okay. I, I, I think that it's, I, I think that, there's a lot of, I mean, I think Jassy's doing, listen, Jassy's doing the hard work, right? You know, um, you know, it's like the thing when, you know, when, a, when, a, when a, a parents get divorced, right? And the mom ends up doing the hard work and then the husband gets to be the good time guy, right? <laughs> uh, the father gets to be the good time guy. Maybe not always, but, um, and so, so Jassy's doing the hard work. I'm just not sure. I think that it's, it's going to come a point where Amazon's going to need somebody who seems more inspirational right than he seems now maybe he's got that gene and he just hasn't had a chance to you know he's got those muscles and hasn't had a chance to flex them yet but at some point they're gonna i think i just think they're gonna need somebody to 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 inspire the the truth it's a big amount of charisma a big amount of vision a big amount of inspiration that it takes right to motivate an organization yeah. and a partner and a customer and partner base of that size yeah. so it is a bezos-esque presence right and obviously he's well proven uh to have done it so i get it i i, I uh and he's one of those um, founders he's one of those founders who knew how to run a company as opposed to a founder yeah. who doesn't know how to run a company yeah That's, he did he built, he built a really good team around him too to to execute on that vision uh of how to build and operate a company and a lot of that is st still does exist today it's being tested yeah. you know the leadership principles you know right. how they how they run the business how they evaluate investment how they serve customers you know they it's all being tested today, um, but I think they'll, I think they're going to do okay through. Right. You know, it, it could be a rough next year, but I think you look out two, three, four years from now, and Amazon's going to be just fine. And uh, and maybe more dangerous, you know. Oh yeah, no doubt. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, potentially more dangerous. Yeah, but you know, it, yes, for sure. Right. Okay. Last one, real quick. Um, I've been reading about this Chat GPT, this chatbot, which, if I'm reading things right. It could replace me. Um, so, I guess my question is: I mean, what's your sense of this? Is that it, I mean, it 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 replicates actual communication in a way that you know 
Alexa does not, or in a way that Siri does not. Um, parlor trick, or is it a real meaningful innovation? This actually brings us back to the beginning when we talked right. about, you know, is, it, is there meaningful innovation taking place out there? So well, I think most of, <clears throat> most of where innovation has happened in the last decade has been around AI. Right. You know, AI, AI has gotten a lot better. By its very nature, AI gets better in time because the, the, the machines teach the machines, the data teaches the data, right? And it, and it iterates and gets better, actually exponentially better. I think it's exponentially, volumetrically, I don't know, geometrically. Uh, it, gets, it, it, it gets better. I, I think that this chat GPT is pretty cool. I've done a little research on it the last couple of days. I didn't sign up for an account, although I might. Um, it, it, it definitely, you can see that the level of deep learning uh, that is that has been realized or is being realized uh, is a step beyond what we've seen, at least from a public consumer standpoint, from the likes of what a Google, you know, or an Amazon, you know, may have may have produced. Um, you know, I think like the traditional chat bots and things like that that folks have uh, invested in and many retailers have like for customer service and whatnot, I think those things are all going to get, uh, they're going to be very quickly uh, uh, obsolete. Yeah. And this chat GPT is going to go deeper. I think they're talking about having that power Bing. Uh, I think it's going to really help Bing's search share. Oh, I would imagine. What what can Bing search, search, search share be? It can't be I that. I don't know. I don't know. The only reason, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 my it's when, when you buy an app or an Apple, when you don't buy an Apple, when you buy a PC right. with Windows, right. uh, it is your default browser. But everybody gets rid of that and puts in Chrome, right. uh, uh, or it's the it's the uh, it's kind of in your like toolbar, right. you know. So, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's some share in, in Bing, but I think this could make it really interesting because you're actually going to get like a list, like a menu list of search results. You're going to get like context textual search right. results like conversational search results and uh yeah it's pretty cool and of course it's just going to get better and better right as it gets smarter and it's going to become you know at some point it will feel like how's there not a human on the it already does you know when you some of the things it produces you swear there's got to be a human on the other end of it. well and we had talked before we kept, we started with you know this was the problem at google right they they actually came up with a software that their developers said would eventually become sentient. Yeah, exactly. And, and it scared the crap out of people. Yeah. And, and he's gone, yeah. right? And he got fired. And so, <laughs> but it is, I mean, so, at the level at which that they invest in and the capabilities that they're, that they're bringing forth in, in this deep learning, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it, 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 it quickly becomes very human-like uh in it's the way that it processes and the way that it it communicates you know and i i you know google's still doing a bunch in the space right. amazon and aws still doing a bunch in the space amazon i know just from my experience with the company has you know a lot of deep learning you know obviously in the retail uh space and advertising there's a fair amount there but you know in aws across the various practice areas of aws and medical and and those you things your, there's a lot you of apple and apple's got to be doing a lot of oh, this. i'm sure of course apple is. Right. yeah i mean siri was siri was one of the very first right so siri was the first personal assistant right yeah yeah, yeah. well listen yeah, so it, that's gonna be fun to watch it here's the deal i've seen this movie before and it always goes better for the machines than it does for us <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not this time hey listen this has been great this has been interesting i mean it, you know here, there's a phrase in my business which is the news gods always to deliver and it feels like every you know every couple wow. of weeks there's always lots of stuff to talk about so always lots about well hey. we'll see what's up in uh two weeks from now sounds good hey listen take care thanks kevin thanks everyone